Hey, we want to welcome you and thank you for being here. And we're very excited to have Rachel Mack. In fact, I wanted to point out a few things for those of you who may or may not watch The Voice. Uh, and you want to clarify for us. Actually, you were on the season that just ended two months ago. Yes, in season May. 20. Yeah, and then you also ended, uh, how, what, what place did you take at the end? I made it to the finals. I was fourth place. Fourth place. That's amazing. Now... What's even, what's even just as impressive, or maybe even more impressive than that, not only did you knock out all the other minors and all the other females, uh, but at the time, you were how old when this took place? I was 15 when it started and then 16 when it ended. Yeah, so she had a birthday somewhere in there, but 16 years old, that's incredible, right? And so uh, that's, it's really cool. Now, I want to ask you this question, and this is really the question that my daughters told me to ask you, okay? As a 15-year-old girl, what was it like to be coached by Nick Jonas. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So, uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk, and I wonder often, because I'm a huge advocate of the show I watch. I've never missed an episode. Uh, so I've always wondered, do the actual coaches stick with the artists, even, even the ones who don't necessarily win first place, after the show? So tell us a little bit about that. You know, I, I can't speak for the other coaches, but I know what Nick has done for me. And first and foremost, we all know he's an amazing musician, but he's also an amazing person. And he told me that he'd help me after the show, and he's been true to his word. Um, and he's just been a gr great mentor. He's had similar experiences with me in the music industry, and so it's great to have him in my life. Yeah, and so you're going down to Nashville and recording some stuff soon, right? Yes, sir. And, and uh, what's really cool is that uh, if you go on Spotify, uh, all uh, you got at least five songs on there, right, that, that are available for download, all of your live performances. What are they? Actually, they're your finalist songs? or what Just are, all of my live performances. All your live performances are on Spotify, including the duet that she did with Nick Jonas. How about that? She did a duet. duet. Let me touch you. Beep. Here we go. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And then uh, now, now the next thing I wanted to cover was, uh, now many people don't know this, but you have a very close connection to Heritage Church. So tell us kind of what that is. So about 10 years ago, we went to a church called Discover Church, um, where my dad was a worship leader there, um, which later branched off to Heritage Church. And yeah, there's a merger about 10 yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then we were part of that, and we were part of Heritage for a little bit, and so this has been a big part of my life. Yeah, that's very cool. So if those of you may not have caught that, about 10 years ago, uh, Heritage merged with Discover Church. So I've been told by your dad backstage that actually there are plenty of people from Discover Church that have been here for the duration that, that know your family, which is really cool of your strong connection. Many people also don't know how incredibly local you are, right? You're only six miles up the road. You serve at a church. Tell us about that and where it is. I serve at Lake Point Church. I'm a worship um, leader there, and that's on 24 and Van Dyke. So that's just right, right around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 24 and Van Dyke. If any of you ever want to pop over, you sing most Sundays there. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming. Okay, so uh, yeah, if you want to pop over there, Lake Point Church, which is extremely cool, uh, and we appreciate you being here today. So the last thing we want to cover is uh, this next song that you're about to sing. You actually sang it on The Voice as one of your live performances, and uh, and I actually loved the story behind it because uh, we were talking uh, earlier about it's very difficult to live out your faith in an environment like that, and this song, even though it's a secular song, it's not necessarily a, a true you know Christian worship song. There's a lot of really... A a lot of hope and a lot of spirituality found in that. So tell us a little bit about that. So when you're in LA and especially in an environment like this, it's extremely busy. And most people know that when you're busy, it's, it's dangerous, especially for your faith. You know, you have to take time and um, spend time with God. And I didn't have time to do that. And I was feeling really guilty about that. So it was really a blessing for me to be handed this song and be able to perform it. Um, because it really was a worship song for me. Um, the line, if you could see what I could see, you'd be blinded by the colors is, um, it's God speaking to me and it's um, God speaking to all of us and about how he sees something in us that we don't see in ourselves and he sees what's down the road. Um, and it was really powerful to me to be able to share that with other people and it was my form of worship. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And I love this song also because in a, in, a, in a large way, it kind of sort of symbolized your future as well. It's a song of encouragement. Uh, when, you, when you don't know what the future is, you know, the song says, I see a rainbow for you. There's a rainbow around the corner. And so it's a song of hope as well. So uh, as she begins to sing this, uh, one more time, Rachel Mack, everybody. Slogans, adages, quotes, and more. Put your hands together for everybody's favorite show. Where have I heard that before? Well, I'll be honest. When I when I was backstage listening to her sing, I was thinking, like, why didn't we have her sing the entire service? Why don't I just cut my sermon down to like five minutes and invite her back out? I know you'd love that, probably. Uh, she was incredible, wasn't she? That was amazing. And uh, we want to welcome you once again. We're in part three of a five-part series that we're doing called Where Have I Heard That Before? And so the song that she just sang actually speaks into sort of the end of the message and, and the direction that we're kind of ending with. Uh, but for now, I want you to know that this entire series has been based on one idea, which is there are so many sayings that we hear in our culture that we use and that we hear and respond to that we have no idea necessarily that is even tied to the Bible. So in week one, we talked about about going the extra mile and the idea of like, hey, I've used that, I've heard that before, but maybe we didn't you know, realize that it originated with Jesus. And then last week we talked about, and the truth shall set you free, and whatever, you know, what, 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 all the truths that go along with that. Today, we're looking at the famous saying uh, that I've used and heard my entire life that has actually been misquoted, but I've heard it this way my whole life. Money is the root of all evil. So today we're tackling that and finding out really, uh, unpacking it and finding out really what's the meaning behind that. So as we dive into this together, would you pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love in our lives. We thank you for the blessing of rain and, and just the blessings that you give to us. Uh, thank you for the wonderful ability of, of Rachel and the, and the privilege of having her entire family with us today. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear from you. And just like the rain is falling, Father, we pray the Holy Spirit may fall in our lives that we may hear uh, your encouraging truths and help us to respond to them. We love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how many of you, by show of hands, have heard this saying this way? Uh, you've heard the actual saying, 
and again, it's a misquote, but it's made popular by saying money is the root of all evil. How many of you have heard that or even used that? Okay, so it's probably 80 to 90% of the people in person, and I'm sure online that's probably true as well. Well, here's the problem with that, is that it's actually a misquote. There are five words that are omitted from the way that it was actually originally said. It was written originally by the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, and uh, we're gonna find out uh, you know, re- what it really means, but the idea that to say, that all the evil that has ever existed in the world and that all the evil that will exist comes down to money is pretty crazy. Money is the root of all evil. If that were true, then that would mean this. That would mean that this stuff right here, uh, you know, there's like 300 bucks that I have in 20s, okay? It's like this is so dirty. Look how dirty this is. Look how dirty I am for holding this. In fact, I, by the way, money is dirty, by the way. Did you know that? It's got a lot of germs, but I don't mean that kind of dirty. I mean like dirty to your soul. Right? Because if money is the root of all evil, that means this. That means that those of you that are listening to me that have piles of this stuff, you're disgusting. <laughs> you're disgusting people, right? I, mean, I bet you, you know, you sit at home all day and you rub money all over your face, right? And you sit in your piles of money. And I bet when you laugh, it's evil and maniacal. Maybe you do this with your hands, right? But uh, let me ask you this. Do you, do you want this money? Do you want it? Sinner. Because after all, it's the root of all evil. Not just some evil, but every evil that exists. And I want you to know something else too, okay? When you come to church, not only are we gonna tell you just how evil this is, but at the end of the service, we're gonna take an offering. We want you to give that money to us. (laughs) Because in your hands, oh, it's awful. Because in your hands, you you disgusting hands. You know, listen, in your hands, it manifests itself. You know what the word manifest is? It's a fancy church word. I'm clergy. I know what that means. You probably don't even know what that means. But it manifests itself because we're clergy uh, in all sorts of evil ways. But if you give it to us in our hands, it becomes holy. And it becomes, you know, purposeful. Because that's why the church, you know, takes an offering. Listen, that's crazy, right? In fact, I don't know if you know this, but my entire salary, my whole whole entire career uh, is completely 100% dependent on your generosity. Uh, Me paying my bills, me sending my kids through college, and everything that I do depends on that. To actually say that money is the root of all evil is crazy. It's so superlative and ridiculous to even think about. And again, it's a misquote as we're about to find out. So this next story that I'm about to tell you, uh, I can count on probably one hand the number of times that I've actually told this story on a big church stage because it's just so ridiculous. But when I was in college, I was really good at sales. I jumped around from sales job to sales job, and I ended up uh, with with, with being in one of the most lucrative jobs. It was the most lucrative job I've ever found in my entire lifetime, even including what I make today, okay? And that is when I was only 19 or 20 years old, I worked for telemarketing uh, for a company called MCI Long Distance. For those of you who don't remember MCI, back then it was only three, you know, it was AT&T, MCI was second largest, then Sprint, and then Sprint eventually they bought MCI out, which is why many of you haven't heard of it. But back then, telemarketing was new. Now, now telemarketing is horrible. It's, it's a terrible job, right? In fact, our phones even warn us, warning, warning, <laughs> spam, junk. You know, we don't answer it. But back then, it was brand new. And so when you called somebody, they actually answered their phone. They're like, can you take five minutes and talk to me about your long distance? People are like, thanks for calling. Yes. And so I would talk to people. And so for the month of July of 1991, I was the number one MCI salesman in the country. So they had 13 centers. Our center was number one. Night shift, day shift. Night shift was number one. 64 bays. Our bay was number one. I was the number one in the bay. And I made 100, get this, $165 an hour which means uh, back back then, minimum wage was, ready for this, $3.35. So to all the people working really hard at McDonald's, I was like, hee hee, because I made $165 an hour. And even after a ridiculous uh, 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 commission taxes, I still brought home like almost like a $9,000 check. For, you know, and that's just crazy for a young guy. And yet I did. And so they sent me to President's Club. And what that is, is like, you know, the, the, the best salesman, they, they treat you on top of that to reward you. And, and they sent me to the steak and lobster dinner where all the best salesmen of MCI got together and they rewarded me by adjusting my sales goals, paid me for the evening. I get to enjoy this. I walked through the door. They hired uh, uh, models, like the modeling agency. And all these models ran like uh, 
uh, blackjack and truck a luck and all these, you know, 21 and all, all these kind of things. I'm like, I'm like 20 years old. And I won like another like three or four or $500. And then they were giving away prizes, $50 to anybody who has a clip-on tie. And, you know, and then they're just giving out money. I had like an extra $800 and just, just by being there. It was crazy. And then they did this whole countdown of the top uh, 10 salesmen in the entire country. And everybody would shout, number 10. And they'd say, so-and-so. Then everybody would shout, number nine. they go, so-and-so. And they count all the way down. And when they get to number one, there was a thing that they do. And this was so crazy. They go, number one, as in, and the whole crowd shouts out, nobody does it better. And they're like, that's right. Nobody does it better than Chris Zarba! And I remember standing up, and I kid you not, everything in the gymnasium or in the banquet hall, everything went completely dark, and a spotlight shone on my, you know, just followed me up the stage. And then they started playing the music, ba 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 bad to the bone. And I'm walking up, I'm like, hey. And I grabbed this plaque, and on the back of the plaque was another check that I didn't even know was coming. It was taped on the back of the, of the check, and it was $2,000 bonus for being number one. I was like, what? And I was just crazy. And then I sat back down. We went through the whole evening. A lot of other stuff happened that night. But the, but the most significant thing at the end of the night was they had a final drawing of $1,000 cash. And there was a lot of people that, you know, barely made it there by wild card, weren't even paid to be there, including my friend Russ, who was next to me. And he's like, man, this is my only shot at winning any money tonight. They did this big drawing. Everybody had one ticket, 800 people, right? And they're like, we're going to draw the grand prize. They're like, oh my goodness, the grand prize winner is Chris Zarba. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I stood back up and everybody going, boo, <laughs> because I won the most money. And they're like, boo. And as I was walking up, they decided to overthrow the booze by going, ba 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 bad to the bone. And I walked up, I grabbed my extra thousand dollars. And I was like, this is crazy. Now, the point of the story is this. Was that sinful? Like, was it bad? Was it evil? I got news for you. No, okay? It wasn't. In fact, I'll tell you this, that if somebody were to call me right now and offer me a job that paid $165 an hour, I would literally answer the call during my sermon. And I'd be like, hang on, let me pray about it. Yes. <laughs> then I'd be like, well, see you later, Heritage. And I'm that, I mean, listen, uh, it wasn't evil. It wasn't bad at all because money's not the root of all evil money, it, it, we're going to get to this in a minute, is actually a neutral thing. It's, it's neutral. It's just a tool. It's a gift that God gives. So here are a couple things that we want to uh, point out or talk about, okay? Not only is money a neutral gift that God gives to us or a tool, but the Bible actually talks about money more than any other topic. In fact, 10 times more than any other topic in the entire Bible. And the reason why, it's really simple. It's because God knows that this stuff right here is the chief competitor for our affection. It's the chief competitor for our devotion. So that's the reason why God gives it to us. He asks us to be wise with it, to be good stewards. Of course, we're supposed to make money. In fact, I pray that you get rich. I pray that God blesses you to the point to where you have loads of money and that you just simply use it as a tool and a gift, uh, just as the scripture tells us. So let's find out where this misquoted phrase originated from. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6. So the Apostle Paul writes it this way. But godliness... With contentment is great gain. And that word contentment is actually a key word that we're going to come back to. But isn't that an incredible statement already? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we could take nothing out of it. Wonderful perspective. But if we have food and clothing, uh, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then here it comes. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So the two, five operative words, love of and all kinds of evil. Then he goes on and says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So isn't it interesting that Paul talks about contentment and he talks about money and he warns us not of the evil thing called money, but the love of money. And it's not the root of all evil, it's the root of some evil. He says all kinds, which means it comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes in our lives. And he even says only some, some people have strayed from the faith and have pierced themselves with this trap. And so here's the good news for today. This message has nothing to do with giving or generosity because this truth has nothing to do with giving or generosity. What, it, what this is, is it points to and warns us against loving money too much. 
And so Jesus also spoke into uh, this idea. And so look at uh, Matthew 6, verse number 24. So Jesus himself said this, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And then he says, you cannot serve God and also be enslaved to money. Now, this is translated into English in a lot of different ways. You may have heard it. You cannot serve God and mammon. There's the word mammon. And when, when the Bible was written in the original Greek and it was first translated into English in the year 1611, the word was used mammon. And this word actually can be better translated into valuable treasures. You cannot serve God and valuable treasures, or in other words, stuff. And it really is just talking about the love of money, which again is a close cousin and directly connected to wanting stuff. Now, what's really interesting for us is growing up and living in the United States of America, you know, we read, don't be enslaved to wanting more stuff, and yet it's incredibly challenging, isn't it? Because we live in the United States. I don't know if you know this or not, but the United States has the largest homes in, uh, on average than, than for the rest of the world. Let me, let me say that differently. If you have a house that is only 1,000 square feet, that is larger than seven-eighths of all the homes in the world. Did you know that? And most of us have a house probably even more than 1,000 square feet. Not only do we have large homes, but we actually have so much stuff that we have to build these things around the country called uh, storage facilities, or, or you store it, right? Right, you could actually, uh, did I say that wrong? Or you could actually store your stuff. In fact, uh, right outside of Heritage, right here behind Hobby Lobby, there's a huge facility with like 100 garages where people pay somebody to store all their extra stuff. Did you know how many storage unit facilities there are around the country? Just in this country alone, we have over 30,000 of those places that make up of one and a half billion square feet. And we as Americans, take most of our useless junk and we pay those facilities $12 billion a year to store our stuff, which is incredible, isn't it? So here's the problem, and you might want to write this down. The problem is we are obsessed with wanting more stuff. This is not new news. I think that especially pre-COVID, a lot of us found ourselves uh, with a bad perspective. So just for a little fun, I decided to look up a few facts. Only in America this is possible. Only in America. Did you know that we in this country have 46 types of Oreos? <laughs> 46 types of Oreos. Who would ever need such a thing? We do, right? Did you know that the most expensive bottle of water is, is the number one market is in the United States of America? And it's called Tasmanian bottle, uh, bottle water. And it's because it has the purest air. And for one bottle, it's $25. And that's a real thing, okay? There's another thing in America called Ramona Black. And believe it or not, it's designer toilet paper. And for one roll of toilet paper, it's $12. And I'll be honest, I'd really like to try that. It's just kind of a big deal for me. <laughs> so, did you know this? That pre-COVID, and it may be true now as well, but pre-COVID, there was a guy that works at Mars Candy, who, by the way, that company owns M&Ms, and his title actually was this, the VP of Indulgence. And for the M&M product, that you could actually pay somebody to put your face on an M&M and then have it delivered to you, and it's $100 a bag. So if you're that conceited and self-absorbed, you could actually spend the afternoon consuming yourself right? And so it's just crazy, this problem. But guess what? It didn't just exist in this country, and it certainly doesn't just exist in the 21st century. This is a problem that, that is connected to the core of who we are as a human race. The reason why we know that is if you rewind thousands of years ago, we're going to read from a little passage in Ecclesiastes written by the wisest man that God called the wisest man who ever lived. And here's how it reads, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Solomon, way back then, said, those who love money never have enough. Would you just like shout out something like amen to that comment? Is that not so true, right? Those who, have, who love money never have enough. Those who love wealth are never satisfied with their income. 
And then he goes on and says, this too is meaningless. Now the context for that last comment is, is that Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, decided to write down all the wisdom and he realized that this life is just but a blip and that, and that after you die, you spend eternity somewhere and all the things that we're consumed with and bothered with in this life, he deemed as meaningless or vanity. And he said, you know, it's so vain to pursue power and, and all these different things, you know, have statues erected in your honor. It's just, it's all meaningless, it's all vanity. And he goes on and said, those who love wealth, it just doesn't mean anything in the end. And it's wisdom that not only is true then, but think about it thousands of years later, how is it that our culture could identify with this verse? And the answer is because it's in you and it's in me. This is not a new problem to want more. If you want to write something else down, you can write this down, that more won't bring you satisfaction. It's true. The real truth is more will never bring you satisfaction. So let me ask you this. What if I were to do an exercise, and this is from my wallet, and this is the the highest limit credit card that I have. So like tens of thousands of dollars are possible if you wanted to charge it to the limit. What if I were to give this and give this to my wife and said, honey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and fulfill every desire that you have. Everything that you see, I want you to purchase in terms of stuff, right? Just buy whatever it is that you want, and I want you to max this thing out to its full max, you know, go to town. Let me ask you a serious question. Do you think that at the end, she would be satisfied? Do you want to know what the answer is? We'll never know the answer to that question because it's <laughs> never going to happen. Never in a billion, trillion, million years is that ever going to happen. We'll never know. Okay, now, here's the idea. The idea is this. Uh, the, the solution to all of this is very simple, but it's not easy. And, there, and by the way, simple is not a synonym for easy. There's a lot of things that are really, really simple, just really difficult to do in our lives. So here is the answer. What is the solution? The solution is to surrender. We're going to talk about three different types of surrender. So a few words before we dive into it, and I think this. I think the pandemic has really made us more aware of what's truly important in life. Would you not agree with that? I think it really has. I think a lot of us who were maybe perhaps consumed with the more, wanting more, probably have right-sized our perspective. I think that as we're crawling out of our caves, you know, out of this pandemic, I think a lot of us are gonna turn over a brand new leaf and we're gonna start right-sizing our desire of wanting more. But for a lot of us, we haven't learned it. And maybe for, for us, we already feel it, we just haven't identified it. So it's important today to pause and say, maybe this is the perfect time to realize how we once were and how we should be moving forward. It's time to recognize the problem of wanting more, to actually balance what the Bible says of, you know, when we're given money as a tool and a gift, we're supposed to save it. We're supposed to be wise. The Bible says we're supposed to leave an inheritance to our children's children. Like all those things are good things. But at the same time, God calls us to live in faith and to be generous. And of course, there's two ends of the pendulum. What we don't want to do is we don't want to live the way that we used to live by wanting more and not being good stewards. So if you're a person who's been trying to keep up with the Joneses, today maybe you'll agree to let the Joneses win moving forward. So here's three types of surrender that we're gonna do. Here's the first one. Number one, surrender the wallet idol. So we're gonna do a little exercise and I really truly want you to do this with me. Would you please humor me? I want you to reach into your pocket or into your purse. I want you to literally pull out your wallet. I'm gonna give you a few seconds. In fact, if you're at home, you'll be very much tempted to stay on the couch and say, I'm not doing that, but I promise you, uh, it's powerful when, when, you, when you do it. So I'll give you a second. Run and grab your wallet. And I want you to uh, hold it in your hand, okay? So if you're in the room with me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your wallet. I want you to put it in your hand. I want you to look at it. And I just want you to caress it. <laughs> oh, it's so great, isn't it? And do you know that this becomes the temple of the idol of the 21st century? You know why? Because the God of mammon lives in here. Remember that verse that Jesus said, you cannot serve God and money or God and mammon or God and stuff, right? The God of mammon lives inside here. And, and, and listen, the danger of this is actually when we tell ourselves that this little piece of leather has the power to make us feel better in all kinds of ways. We feel more successful. It's gonna get, bring us security that you know, we deem is, is necessary. It's gonna, it's gonna make us feel you know, whole or complete. It's gonna make us feel worthy. And we tell ourselves all all sorts of things that are attached to this little piece of leather. Now, here's the exercise I want you to do, all right? I want you to take your wallet and I want you to hand it to the person to your left. 
Everybody do that. Now you can keep your eye on it. This is church. All right. Hand it to the person to your left. Keep your eye on it. Now, now that you have the person's wallet to your right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pass the offering. I want you to give like you've always wanted to give. Just give freely and generously. I'm just kidding. Give, give the wallet back to the person. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Okay. All right, so now that you have your wallet back, hopefully we didn't have any incidences or anything like that in the room. But I want you to take your wallet and maybe what you can do is look at your wallet and associate a feeling or a choice or a resolve. And maybe today you can say, you know what? Today's the day. July 11, 2021. I'm going to vow that moving forward, you know, fall hits and the rhythm goes in uh, to, you know, to, to play and everything else. I'm going to vow that it's going to be different than it was pre-COVID. It's going to be different. Maybe it doesn't take COVID. Maybe it's just, maybe even after COVID, you're just waking up for the first time and you're like, you know what? This is true of me. This is true of my fiance or my husband or my wife. And you know what? It's true of our household. So we as a nation need to recognize it. We as, a, you know, as deciders of our, of our household. But to, today could be a great day to look at this physical thing so that every time you pull it out, you're reminded today's the day where it stops. And today's the day I'm going to decide that I'm not going to surrender or be enslaved to the God of mammon anymore. Here's the second type of surrender that we can do. Okay? The second type of surrender is the surrender to commitment, or excuse me, contentment. Okay? Now, I want you to read with me these words written by the Apostle Paul, but it's very important to recognize that he wrote about contentment, and he wrote from a prison cell. So he was writing to the church of Philippi. It was called Philippians, and this is chapter 4, verse number 12. Here's how it reads. Paul says, I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Man, wouldn't that be nice? I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, another version, another translation may read that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Many of you have seen that verse before. It's very popular. In fact, whenever you go into a, a gymnasium or a workout room that, you know, is like Christian owned, there's usually a poster of a guy with huge muscles. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Huh? And we just take that verse and we apply it to whatever we want to apply it to. But did you know that that verse was actually written that went kind of sort of like qualifying Paul's claim of learning content? Isn't that amazing? He says, hey, I've learned the secret of being content. And by the way, contentment is not being happy with what you want to get. It's actually being happy with, you know, with, with oh, I said that wrong. Dadgum it. Okay. <laughs> contentment doesn't come from getting what you want, but wanting what you get. Ah, that could have been really powerful. So, uh, so get this. So the apostle Paul was in prison. Now, what you may not know is this that when he wrote the letter of Philippians, he was writing it because the church of Philippi had given him a financial gift. And he's in prison. In fact, not only is he in prison, but he's awaiting a trial by Emperor Nero at this time. A, a trial that actually he lost. A trial when he was in Rome that actually determined that he was gonna get killed for his faith. And it ended up that Paul, just a few years later after he wrote this letter, was sentenced to die and got his head chopped off and he was buried beneath the catacombs of Rome in 68 AD. So as, as, as the church of Philippi gave him a financial gift, they were, they were concerned for him and his welfare. And they were concerned about the way he had been treated and everything he had suffered just because he stood up to be a Christian. And what Paul was saying was, don't worry about me. I don't regret anything. In fact, he goes on and says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. And in that sense, I regret nothing on what I have done. And you've seen me on the greatest ups, you know, and you've seen me when I was down and out. And I'm telling you, whether I was really, really well fed or whether I was starving, I've learned to be content and I've learned the secret. And then he goes on and says, I can do these things in only one way. I can do all these things only through Christ who strengthens me. And so it encourages us that when we surrender to contentment, not only do we surrender to the, you know, the idol of the wallet, but we say, God, contentment is something that can be learned. 
Contentment is something that could be adopted, that if we just right-size our perspective and say, God, help me to just be okay with what I have. This desire of wanting more, I'm not talking about money being evil. I'm not talking about being wise. I'm not even talking about having a lot of money. I hope you have a ton of it. I'm talking about the, 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 uh, uh, the balance of what God calls us to do, which is to live wisely and to live generously with what he's blessed us with. And not wanting more, because when you want more, what happens is this doesn't go away, but this does. And it's not only just giving generously, but it's giving something besides money. God calls us to be generous with our time. God calls us to be generous with our heart, with our intentionality, with our words. He has created us to be fulfilled by living generously, by giving, by paying attention to and addressing the needs of those around us. Certainly those of us who have been blessed enough with a job, who have everything that we need. And so walking with both, you know, sort of like both feet, one in front of the other, with both hands, walking in wisdom and generosity, but more so the perspective of wanting more. So not only do we do those things, but the third surrender is this. Surrender your worry for tomorrow. Now this is a really big one. In fact, I might even say it could be one of the biggest. Because let me ask you a question before we read this uh, passage. What about the economy crash that people are predicting uh, might come? What about my future? What about tomorrow? What about the stock market? What about this or that or what might happen? Of course we have to consider those things. But at the same time, we have to balance our life with faith in God's economy. So here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 26 and also verse number 30. He says, then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. And then he says, which I'm sure was a visual aid, look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest, right? They don't farm, in other words. They don't store food in barns. And yet God feeds them. Are you, uh, and are you far more valuable to him than any birds? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Then he skips down to verse number 30, or we do, and, and it says this, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your heavenly father already knows your needs. And then he challenges, here comes the challenge. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything that you need. So here's my question for you. Why hope in riches when you could hope in the one who richly provides? Why, why do we have to put our hope in something that is so temporary and so futile, uh, you know, and that, that carries with it so many warnings about perspective? Why put all of our hope and why have our hope migrate toward those things when our hope needs to migrate toward the God who tells us how to manage this gift and this tool, that, which, by the way, is very neutral, so that we can live happily and use it as a tool, as a blessing, and a, as to bless others. And so I would just say this for you and for me. As we think about what this means for our lives, uh, just think about this. If we get rid of this more stuff attitude, then we will receive a more life promise from him. Does that make sense? Right, so God promises us to give us more life. And I believe a lot of it for a lot of us. If we give over this idea of wanting more stuff, it'll just release us and empty our hands enough to receive more life from him. And as we begin to just trust him, and whatever it is that God is calling us to do, as we hand over the idea of worry about security that we just have to have just a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, when we give that to him, we find out that God gives us much, much more uh, in our return. Now, this next verse is, some might say it's a little redundant, and I agree, but I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, just a few verses later, here's what Paul says. Uh, chapter 4, verse number 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I love how he says Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ because that emphasizes the miraculous and and mighty work of God. How is he able to do it? Well, just realize just who it is you're praying to, just who it is you're talking to. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the living God that we trust. And so as we contemplate what this means for our lives, I just pray that we would be a people that seek him first and put him above all else. And that we would not walk around misquoting this whole thing, the money is the root of all evil. It's not. In 
fact, God has given this to us as a gift and a tool so that we can bless people and be blessed. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your truths. We ask once again, Lord, that you would help us to know how to respond to these uh, commandments and this encouragement in our lives. Lord, I pray for everybody here listening online, Lord, that we would know what this means for us and help us, Lord, to surrender. Help us to surrender all sorts of unhealthy things that we might uh, find in our spirit, like, sort of like a check in our spirit that may feel a little unhealthy when attached to wanting more. And I pray, Father, that ultimately that our lives would not only be blessed, but that your kingdom would go further, that you would be glorified, and that we would be on the receiving end of so much more than we currently have. So, Father, be with us now. We ask and we pray all of these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to call Rachel Mack back out, and we're going to ask her to lead us in this next song. And we're going to invite you to stand because we think that it would be very appropriate for us to respond with this kind of message. Uh, it's, it's the king of my heart that Jesus would be not only the Lord of our lives, but that we would sing out loud that he will never let us down. So let's sing together.
guys go ahead and take a seat just for a quick moment as we wrap up this service. And my hope is that through that message, through that song, just remember no matter what circumstances come your way, no matter what you're faced with, that you'll know that we serve a God who is good, a God who never lets us down. He never leaves us. As we go to wrap up here in just a moment here, I just want to give you some next steps from today's service and just some things to know about. I mentioned earlier about our baptism service in August, but maybe for some of you, you have questions about baptism. You can actually go to our website and there's a page on there that talks a little bit about why we uh, celebrate baptism, why the importance of it. If you have questions, that's the way to do it. But here's a really quick, simple answer. If you're somebody who chose to follow Jesus, you trusted Jesus at some point over the last few weeks, months, or even years, that's a public, or it's a private decision between you and God. You're deciding to trust Him with your life. Your next step is to go public with your faith by getting baptized in front of your friends and family. And so to us, we're so excited. We've already seen a dozen people or so who have already decided to sign up for that. And so for you, this is just maybe your moment. I can just envision so many people just getting baptized at Sony Creek and just celebrating life change in Jesus. So make sure to go to our website and sign up for that. Also at this time, we're gonna be receiving our offering and this is an opportunity for us to give back to God out of all that he has blessed us with. If you're watching from home, you can hit the give online button or if you're here, you can go to our website or through that app. Um, but if you're a guest here, if you're just joining us for the first time, you're checking out, this is the only part of the service that's not for you. Uh, this is a time for those of us who call Heritage Church their home to give back out to God out of all that he's blessed us with. And so I'm gonna read a verse for you in Malachi. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. And so what God is saying here, this is him testing the people and then also giving the promise. He's saying, give and I promise you'll be surprised at the overflow of blessing that we're giving. And that's our heartbeat here is we wanna be generous people because we trust that every single part of what God gives us is not our own and it's his. And so we give back to God out of all that he has blessed us with. So I just wanna thank you. If you are somebody who participates in giving, I just wanna thank you so much for how you are making an impact in this community and not only locally, but also globally. Thank you so much. But we hope that you enjoyed today's service. If you have a friend or family member who needs to be here for the 12 o'clock service or watch online, make sure to invite them as you guys obviously Experience. It was a great, great weekend. We'll see you next week, we, weekend. We got Pastor Jeff in the house. He's gonna be continuing our series. Where have we heard that before? Where have I heard that before? We'll see you guys next week.